Hey guys, enter the stars and good morning. And welcome to the show. It's going to be a fascinating show as always. For some reason, I feel like our best shows are always on Sunday. Don't know why that happens, but it seems to always be the case. So I want to welcome everybody into the show. Today is St. George's Day in England. And according to friends in England, this is what they're seeing in their Google Doodle for the search engine for Google. Sunday, April 23rd is St. George's Day. Now it's interesting because my first leg of my journey to France will be in England. And I'll share some more details of that as time <coughs> transpires, excuse me. But basically my first leg will be in England. Now here we see that apparently St. George was the dragon slayer. Now this is interesting because I just started talking about, hold on just a second, you guys. I was just talking about, or we just finished the series of the Game of Thrones. And of course it was all about these three dragons that were slayed. We actually saw the three dragon eggs of the White House, the Westeros wing that uh, the White House tweeted out in 2014. And so it's kind of interesting that this is all kind of materializing. Now, St. George is an interesting character. And this is kind of, I'm laying out the, uh, laying out the groundwork for the rest of the show, which we'll talk about. Giants, all of the giants mentioned after the flood. And the reason why we're talking about St. George is because this is, goes back to the ancient times and what these people stood for. And we're going to tie it all back in together. Now, let's see. I think I had him pulled up here. St. George. Now, this is St. George, and apparently he was a martyr. Why was he martyred? For his Christian faith. He would not denounce his Christian faith to the Roman emperor. And so he was killed for that. And of course, when I make the travels through some of these very same roads that that these ancient people that stood up for Christ, I will not denounce my Christian faith either. And I've told you guys on this show that I've called myself the Dragon Slayer because I go after the beast. I don't wait for him to attack us. And so it's kind of interesting that this is all kind of dovetailing in together. St. George's Day in England, here it is. Again, this is only the Google Doodle over in England because this is an English holiday. But here it shows him um, slaying the dragon, you see. And he, again, stood up for Christ, even when faced with death. So this kind of all fits in. I can't wait for the next season of Game of Thrones to reveal itself so that I can start to decode that as well being the seventh season, and we are in the year 5777 in the Hebrew calendar, so I'm sure there will be much to learn from that. Now, there seems to be a little bit of confusion with regard to bloodlines, and we know that Christ was from a pure bloodline. We also know that the giants were spawned from the fallen angels. We know there is a link between giants and fallen ones because it tells us in Genesis. It says that the, the fallen angels came down and went into the daughters of men and from them spawned giants. There were giants in those days and after the flood. It says that right in Genesis. But many people are in denial about that. They don't want to believe that this is true. Because that would mean that there would be fallen angel bloodlines after the flood. Now, I'm going to lay this out as simply as possible because, again, you're going to hear people that deny the serpent seed doctrine. But the evidence is all there. The serpent seed, in other words, the seed of the fallen angels, is among us right now as we speak. And though we don't see giants walking the earth at this time, the blood of those giants is is in fact here, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you. 
Now, many religions kind of ignore these things, and they ignore these Bible verses that we're going to look at. Here's the first one. Let me blow this up. Now, I've got a video on this. It's very old. Instances of giants in the Bible after the flood. Here's one of them. It says, then Ishbi Benob was who was among the descendants of the giant. It says right here, he's a giant, right? This is post-flood, after the flood. Who The weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze weight. Was girded with the new sword, and he intended to kill David. So this was the time of David. And so you're probably wondering, well, how much is 300 shekels? Well, I did the math on this. And one shekel is about half an ounce. Shekels is 150 ounces. And when you divide that by 16 to find out how many pounds, you come up with 10 pounds. So this was a 10-pound spearhead. Now, to compare that, because none of us really know how much a spearhead is supposed to weigh, right? We look at other ancient spearheads from the period, from B.C. These were actually called giant spearheads. Giant 26-inch copper spearheads from Canaan. 2600 BC. These were called giant spearheads, and these were half of the spearhead described in the Bible. These were four and a half pounds. The one I just described to you in the Bible, we found the math on that, and that was 10 pounds. And these were even called giant spearheads from Canaan. Of course, the Canaan knights were giants because the scouts that went out from Israel said that they were like grasshoppers in their eyes. So you see, a normal-sized man could not wield these spearheads. Now I'm going to go back in the chat. We've got more instances of giants we're going to get into in the next couple minutes here. I want to give you guys some shout-outs. I see Danger Vision, T. Kerr, Life of Cal, U.S. and Grey Ghost, John Smith, Method Marine, Althea Nez, Righteous Hawk. Who else did I see in here? John Smith, of course, relevant truths in the house. Appreciate you guys coming out. Let's get into some more of these instances of giants in the Bible after the flood, demonstrating that there was a bloodline of the fallen angels after the flood. Now you have to, have to ask yourself, we all know how bloodlines work. There was an incursion and it, it persisted after the flood. How many people, how many of us are mixed with this blood? That is the question. Here's another situation. This was Og, the king of Bashan. He was left of the remnant of the Raphaim. Now, the Raphaim were the giants. So it's telling right here he's a giant as well. It says, behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Uh, this is suggesting that it was created with additional strength to hold him. It is in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits. And it's with four cubits. This was the length of his bed, his iron bed. How long is nine cubits? His bed was, when you do the conversion, 13 and a half, almost 14 feet long, which means that he was 12 to 13 feet long, which means he was two to three times the height of the average man from that period. More instances of giants after the flood. Now this goes deeper because there's another guy. There was a war at Gath again where there was a man of great stature. Again, they're telling you he's a giant who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. 24 number, and he also had been born to the giant. It tells you right here. So anyone that's telling you the serpent seed is not real, and that there are not two seeds walking around on this planet is telling you a lie. Okay. The question becomes how did this seed proliferate? And I believe the people that are in control and command of this world who rule this world, which is what the Bible says, is said is ruled by the devil in this realm, they all come from these bloodlines. Now, I have a, another video and it gets very specific and I actually track. 
the bloodlines of these giants specifically that we just noted. I tracked them back, and it takes me all the way back. Ham. These bloodlines came out of Ham. More specifically, Canaan. This was just after family got off the, the ark. They were the only human beings on the entire earth. There were eight of them. And when I tracked back all of those giants that I just mentioned, they came out of the Hamite bloodline, more specifically his son, Canaan. Now, why is this important? Because it shows you the source of where these giants came from. It also basically shows you that there is a bloodline, that it is real. And then we can start to derive historical events. We know that Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel, he came out of the bloodline of Canaan, I, I believe. I think it was Canaan. And uh, the e Egyptians came out of the bloodline of Mizraim, which was one of the sons of Ham as well. So we get very specific. See, the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's very specific about these things. Now, this part of the show is going to blow your mind because there is a place called the place of the skull. This is where Jesus was crucified. Okay. It was called Golgotha, which actually means place of the skull. And if you didn't know this, there was a point in history, 28 generations before Jesus was crucified, when David slew Goliath. And he brought his head to Jerusalem, and it was buried at Golgotha, the very place where Christ was crucified. Now, this is fascinating because where was Goliath killed? How did he die? Well, that David took five smooth stones. Out of his pouch. And I believe that the stones represent the pineal stone. Why do I say that? Because when David threw this stone, it hit Goliath square in the pineal gland, the middle of his forehead. And we always see these the, the classic archetype pictures of Goliath with a stone stuck in the middle of his forehead. And because when Christ was crucified, he was crucified in the pineal position between two thieves on the crosses. There were three at the crucifixion of Christ, 28 generations after David buried Goliath's head at the very same location. And these thieves, I believe, that on each side of Christ represent the eyes in your head, Golgotha being the skull. The place of the skull. So now you have all of the anatomical ingredients. You have a skull with two eye sockets, the two thieves, our eyes that deceive us. You have Christ in the middle in the pineal position, slightly elevated above the two thieves, exactly where it should all be. And you have Golgotha. You have the Philistine, Goliath, buried at his feet. So what does all that mean? It is the seeds. The two seeds juxtaposed. You have Christ, the pure seed, versus the giant, the Nephilim seed. Juxtaposed in the very same position. And from David to Christ, 28 generations, then we had the sacrifice. Now, this goes deep, you guys, because 28 is the number of days in a woman's cycle. And each month during our menses, it is like a sacrifice. God overlaid all these things on purpose so that we could know who the Most High is. We can know who His Son is through anatomical allegories, I guess you can call them. Anatomical analogies. Jesus' first miracle was in a temple, and he was fascinating. Doctors, he was 12 years old. What could he have possibly said that could have fascinated 
a doctor. This is all in the Bible. To find the truth and step outside of religious paradigm and understand what all of these symbols really mean. So here's the account of David slaying Goliath. The five uh, stones took a stone out of the bag, flung it, slung it at the Philistine and struck him on the forehead. The stone sank deep. The stone sank into his forehead. Why did it have to sink? Because they're trying to tell you it's the pineal position. Okay. He killed him. Then he cut off his head and took it to Jerusalem, the place of the skulls, Golgotha. This verse here is demonstrating the 28 generations from David to Christ. There were 14 and 14. In the middle of that was the exile to Babylon. And then another 14 to Christ. 28 altogether. Now, this article is interesting because this actually talks about David brought Goliath's head to Jerusalem. It's quite astonishing since Jerusalem at this time was inhabited by David's enemies, the Jebusites. Question is, where did David bring the head of Goliath? The scripture doesn't tell us, but I don't think it would be going too far out on a limb to suggest that the giant skull was buried on Calvary. But it was in Jerusalem with David. The significance of Jesus being crucified on Calvary, the place of the skull, was to show his victory over his enemy, Satan. Thus fulfilling the prophecy, Genesis 3.15, as the nail would have been driven through the heels of the one crucified. The prophecy, prophecy of Genesis 3.15 was being partially fulfilled. Satan would bruise his heel. Now we saw this juxtaposition of the past to the present with Jesus and Moses. We have a similar juxtaposition of the evil versus the good, and Jesus like basically being the finality of the prophecy. And we saw that with Moses erecting the copper serpent. That represented the serpent seed. And Jesus actually talked about that. And he said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, I, the Son of Man, will lift up myself to be crucified. So you see the juxtaposition is the very same juxtaposition that he had with David. So all of this stuff is important, you guys. Um, the Bible is rich, full of all of these stories. Okay, It's full of them. And if we close our minds and rely on men to explain these things to us, instead of finding these things for ourselves, we lose half the story. We simply lose it, and we never get to the bottom of what all this really means. Have faith. Understand that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, and that all the answers don't always come from a man sitting behind a podium. Okay, That God could work through each and every one of you to reveal the truth. Now, I was doing some additional research in Sardinia. And this is pretty fascinating because they actually found these, these tombs of giants all throughout Sardinia. I have a video where I've mapped them. If you do a search on Sardinia, you will see. There's been a huge cover-up there. There's a few documentaries out there on it of basically the Smithsonian and different archaeologists who obviously don't want to be upstaged by farmers finding these artifacts. They don't want to be upstaged by missing. The giants were prolific as recently as almost the time that Christ walked the earth. I believe there were still giants in certain areas of the world. And so, therefore, there's been a cover-up. Also, they know that if you understand that there were real giants walking the earth, that it would validate the Bible. And then more and more people would believe in the true God. Okay, this is why they can't ever admit to you that there were giants after the flood. This is why religious um, cults and things and religious 
doctrines deny the existence of giants after the flood. They try to make you think it's their anomalies. Because they don't want you to know that the serpent seed runs everything. Okay? And I don't know what the end game is on that. But I anticipate that some, there's some big deception that's coming. And giants, they don't want to be part of it. Maybe giants will again come to earth. And they will try to say that some of them are good. And maybe the religious doctrines and the religious people will accept these giants. And then we'll all be coerced to try to follow them or believe that they're holy or something. I don't know. So that's pretty much what I wanted to present to you guys. Um, pretty crazy stuff, huh? So first leg of my journey. Um, I'll, maybe I'll go into that on another show in London. Flying in on the 8th, 9th, and um, maybe I'll just, I'm, I plan on doing like some kind of documentary on where I'll be staying, put it and I'll edit it all together and hopefully have it up at least a week after um, I'm there in France. We're supposed to have a special guest tomorrow. I haven't touched base with her in a couple days, so I hope it's still on. And her name is Twyla. And she has fought for the privacy of newborn children in the United States. Read about her in Wikipedia. I reached out to her on Twitter. And she agreed to do an interview with us tomorrow at 4 p.m. This is a little bit about her. Citizens Council on Health Freedom strongly opposed the passage of M N B N B S S L A over privacy concerns. Twyla Brace. The president of the Minnesota-based activist group voiced concerns over the storage of blood spots and is a strong proponent of having all biobanks destroyed. Brace cited concerns over government-sponsored genetic research, which we were able to prove is going on. It is worth noting that states have been storing samples since the 1960s when NBS was first implemented, and each state has its own policy on DBS storage and research. As of 2008, California has stored over 12,000 samples since 1980, while Texas destroys the samples within months. This is recent because Texas actually got busted storing samples without consent, and they just now decided to destroy them. Privacy advocate groups voiced concern on the potential abuse of these samples in both medical and forensic uses. This is newborn screening. Every child born their blood is taken and they are genetically profiled and that information is being stored. Some have cited the sharing of genetic information with the Department of Homeland Security. Go figure. However, past practices and clear practices on use and limitations indicate that there is a distinct separation between medical and forensic use. State laboratories have been known to turn down requests from law enforcement to access data and samples even in cases for identification of missing children. Yeah, they're telling us that, but what is really going on? So we're going to interview Twyla hopefully tomorrow. On a previous video, we had identified that the, what was it, the labor board was responsible for newborn screening. And in that video, we were able to identify that. And let's see if we can find it now because they love scrubbing this stuff after we discover it. Information never goes viral because of the censorship. And then it's just lost forever. The only place it is in, is in my brain. But I, in that previous video, we talked and showed how the labor board was responsible for genetic screening of newborns. Why would the labor board be responsible for genetic screening of newborns? That is the question. And I'll find that and have that ready for us for the show tomorrow. And that'll be the nail in the coffin for these people that wish to identify us before we've even come into this world. 
and had a chance to have a say in our privacy. And this is huge. For some of you have experienced targeting, and it is real to you. And, you know, a lot of this obviously is our path, our life path. But uh, the enemy also is going to fight against us. These are the principalities talked about in the Bible. Things we're fighting against, we have no idea we're fighting against. And the fact that they're storing all this genetic information and they know exactly who each of us is. Our bloodlines, we just talked about the bloodlines of the giants versus the pure bloodlines. Obviously, the enemy is going to try to identify any of us who have strong blood. You know, in the um, Star Wars city uh, series, they called it midichlorines. And this was supposed to be like the Jedi blood. And, and the Jedis had very strong midichlorines. And maybe I'll look into that. There may be clues into that whole part of the story of Star Wars. So... Something about the blood, you guys, always has been since the beginning of time. Okay, I'm in the chat. Yes, I'm going to ask Twyla about RH blood as well. That's one of the questions I have for her, Method Marine. So thanks for bringing that up. You guys got some rain over there, huh, John? Right on. All right, you guys. Um, See more of you kind of filtering in for the show. Now it's kind of over, but um, sorry, there's not more to talk about. Identify this once we can ask her about O negative. Um, we're gonna. I'm trying to get it set up through Skype for the interview. Last time we did an interview, I had a problem because it was through a speakerphone, and you guys could not hear her. So we're gonna try this. Through Skype, and um, so you guys will be able to, you know, be in the chat here because I'm just basically in a screen capture of Skype on live show here, and then uh, so you guys will be able to ask kind of whatever questions you want. I'm not sure about Twyla's comfort level with um, targeted individuals, so we may or may not get into that based on what she thinks, but. Um, we're definitely going to pick her brain about everything else, her fight against all of this, why she decided to fight for these children. Obviously, something must have happened in her life for her to be an advocate for children's privacy rights. And this is a big deal, you guys, because once we take away their power to identify us, many of us will be able to just live normal lives without having the enemy at our heels all the time, quite literally. Uh, it's going to be, identify this, ask what time. It's going to be 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time tomorrow. That's when we're scheduled. So, um, like I said, I haven't heard from her in a couple of days, so let's hope we're still on. I'll, we've been communicating through Twitter, so um, that's what we'll do. Now, um, King Hugs and Kisses just said six fingers, six toes. Yes, and there are actually people today with six fingers and six toes. From the giant bloodline. This is crazy. This is not a joke. This is not Photoshop. Celebs. Six toes. Here are the images. And we've got Oprah. We've got Halle Berry. It's kind of gross looking at toes, right? We've got uh, this woman, I forgot her name here. These are called, these are signs, genetic signs of the bloodline. Okay. Many, many. This lady just has a crossover toe. I don't know what that might mean, but. Anyway, here's some familiar faces with six fingers or six toes. Anyway, there was actually a child. Wow, this this kid has bunches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow, 
Now you got to look in, look at these and make sure some of these are photoshopped. So maybe, um, but we do know that there's some weirdness going on. Now, the interesting thing is with all this money that some of these celebrities have, they don't get this like corrected be because they're counting on the ignorance of people. And this is not to say that all people that have six fingers and six toes are evil. This is not what this is about, you guys. Jesus came to bridge the gap of the blood, Jews and Gentiles, both. Okay. He demonstrated that some of the Jews of the pure line were just as evil as some of the dark side people. I mean, they 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 actually crucified him, his own people, Jews. You see, so that that's why he had to show that dichotomy. That's why he had to show that hypocrisy, because he was bridging the gap in the middle for those who believe in him. That's why one thief on the cross would be with him in paradise. They were both thieves. One believed and one didn't, you see. It's interesting how a cross return on its side looks like an X. It's like the mark. I believe the X is the mark of the beast. So back in the chat. You know, and I've been asked for by some people to submit my blood for a blood test and get all my DNA and genetic information. But I'm a little hesitant to do that. Because now they're going to know my DNA and genetic information, right? You think they, they're not storing all of this once you send it in and submit it? I think they are. So I'm not submitting my blood to anybody, even though they probably already know. It's awesome, Holy Rosary. So that's the whole point of this, is to help bring everybody closer to God and to all truth. Truth will set you free. Okay, it will show you how deep and complex God really is instead of getting the third grade version of God through religion. God is very deep on so many levels. And then we begin to understand and love him more and draw closer to him, right? Heard of duck people in France, the sister C. Supposedly some are still being born in parts of France. Wow, the duck people. Man, they'd be, if I can find that village, that's going to be a story to cover. And some of you asked where I'm, where I'm going. I guess I'll share a couple, little bit of that with you guys. Um, maybe we'll just do that right now. I'm not going to tell you exactly where I'm going to be because for the safety of the person sponsoring this, I mean, the elite know. Um, they know exactly where I'm going. But they can't let all of you know because then you would know that this work is valid, right? If you saw the elite were starting to harass me and, you know, try to derail this, this whole thing, then you would, it would be like a martyr type situation, even though they wouldn't probably never kill me. I think I'm protected, but then you would all know that what I'm saying is real, right? And they don't want that. So they kind of like, there's a fine line to targeting an individual, especially the ones that are got a level head. Who speak softly and just present the points these are the people that they're afraid of like myself i don't go on rants drop f-bombs i don't do all that and so therefore they cannot say i'm crazy and this is damaging to them because the first thing they want to do is discredit people like me okay but they can't and i don't think they can really kill us but um i don't want to give them any more ammunition than they already have. So let's look at, I think I have this pulled up. Um, let's see here. Okay. The first place I'm going to be staying is the monastery of St. John the Baptist. Now this is interesting because I've always told you guys the, the journeys of the apostles. I know St. John the Baptist was not a, an apostle. He's often linked to that group because he baptized Christ, of course. And I'm going to spend a couple nights at this monastery. Now, this will be interesting because I'm probably going to do some type of a documentary on this. Apparently, this is a, it's ruled by a Russian bishop. I'm going to 
definitely take some camera footage. This is in uh, near London, northeast of London. Apparently, there's monks and nuns and uh, that are going to be praying four hours per day, giving their life to God. So this is going to be very interesting. I've never been in a situation like this, so I'm going to take full advantage of it. Hopefully, I don't offend them by taking video. You know, maybe I'll make keep my my camera private or something. But it's interesting because the person that's sponsoring this trip is actually this is the city Tolshant Knights, and we we're just talking about the knight who slayed the dragon, right? Saint George Day. So I guess this channel is going to get medieval, and we're going to start uncovering some of this stuff. So this is one of the oldest churches in London. Let's see if we can find where it says that here. It's founded in 1958 under the jurisdiction of Metropolitan Anthony Metropolitan and a Russian Bishop of England with six monastics from a number of nations. Where does it say this? History. Oh, here we go. History. Patriarchal Stavropegic Monastery of St. John the Baptist had its beginnings largely in the person of Elder Saphrony after his departure from Mount Athos, where he had been a disciple of St. Seleucid the Athenite. And a subsequent move to Paris, he was to live in a Russian old people's home. So this is a little bit of the history. Seeking out the monastic life. And let's see, where does it say that? Oldest. Later. Anyway, this is in London. I'm going to be there for a few days before we head down to France. And once I get to France, one of the very first places that I want to look at is this castle. I've been to this castle before, but not through the eyes um, of being awake. I was there shortly after 9-11. I think it was in 2002. Things were pretty still, still pretty weird with uh, flights and things. But... Uh, this is Le Mont Saint Michel. And as you can see, it is a full on castle with a full body of water around it. This is a, a, a large bay, and during the high tide, it is surrounded by water. I think this is probably epitomizes one of the most striking castles in all of Europe. It was used in Lord of the Rings. There are actually monks that live here as well. There's a small city. And it winds its way up to the top of this castle all along. It was actually a, a it used to be a drawbridge, but now there's just an arch. It comes through and then it winds its way around this all the way up to the top. And it's hard, kind of hard to get the scale of this, how majestic this is. It's simply unbelievable. Ancient times, this castle did not have this road here. And this whole estuary would fill with water. Here's a, actually a good picture of it here. Invaders would try to come in and invade. And they would sink in quicksand out here. Okay, This was fraught with quicksand. As you can see, they didn't stand a chance when they would wage war and attacks on this castle. Now, this began being built way back before the Dark Ages, okay? And they started, it started out small, and it kind of grew from there. But um, this is Le Mont Saint-Michel. This is literally about 20 miles from where I'm going to be. So I'll hop in the car and check this out. And this is pretty amazing. So, how is it? How is this possible? Well, person sponsoring this trip is basically giving me 
a really, really great deal on rent, which is going to pretty much take all of my YouTube earnings, which is about $400 a month. So I'm going on out on a little bit of faith here. Okay. $400 a month, Casey. Wow. That's all you make on YouTube. Yeah. Especially with everything that's been going on with YouTube defunding everything. But I anticipate that turning around at a certain point. And that's a steal, you guys. And this person is definitely helping me. And we're going to do this together. And I want to include all of you guys in the journey. And that's why I'm announcing it in such detail and letting you know where I'm going to be. Because we're going to put this to work. We're going to show you. And I believe this is another, uh, uh, you know, this is another angle of things that God wants us to expose. Okay. Now, castle, castles like this dot all of the countryside of France. Okay. There's similar castles in the UK. I don't know how often I'll make it up that way, but these types of castles are everywhere. And each of them has a story because. In these areas, they would build these castles in the center of cities and towns, and the uh, cities uh, would basically be built up around these castles. And they're at serfs and manors. I mean, all this is very real. I know we see it depicted on television, but all of this is very, very real. Here's a good shot of it here. Now, in walking up a very steep incline, once you get into this castle, Literally, the street, it's here, is about as wide. You can put your hands out from side to side and touch each of the storefronts. It's very surreal. It's like, it's like a microcosm. It's like a mini city. Everything's really small. The shops are really small. And you enter through this drawbridge type thing, and then you make your way up, 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 up. And then, and then it gets all the way up here, and then it comes back around. And here's the base of the castle. Now along here, you can walk out onto these ramparts. And again, the scale is just, you can't imagine until you're standing up at the top, looking out one of these windows or on one of these ramparts. And it looks like you're at the edge of the world dropping off. And you can see as far as the eye can see in all directions. And it's stunning. It's the stunning experience. And once you get to the top of here, they have a the model showing from year to year, uh, from century to century, how this castle progressed. They showed the first groundbreaking, and then as it progressed, as the years went on, in the building and construction of it, talks about the history of when it was invaded. Make sure we're still connected here. Cool. And all of that stuff. So let's look a little bit at this here. Here it is here. Now, what fascinates me about this kind of history, sure that we can get to the time of Christ, that he walked the earth, that is um, the, time, the, the times that I want to look at in history, because then we can begin to solidify the story of Christ. Now, this is interesting. As of 2009, the island has a population of 44 people. Wow. I'm 44 years old, you guys. I think this was probably meant to be. Look at the coat of arms here, the two fish. How, how many times have we talked about the two fish? The age of Pisces, when Jesus was born into this earth as a man, at the beginning of the age of Pisces. The two fish, and how Jesus took two fish to feed a crowd of 5,000. So the island has held strategic fortification since ancient times. Ancient times, you guys. And since the 8th century AD has been the seat of the monastery from which it draws its name. Okay. The structural composition of the town exemplifies the feudal society that constructed it. On top, God. The abbey and monastery below the great halls, then stores and housing are at the bottom. Outside the walls, houses for fishermen and farmers. Wow, it's fascinating. I wonder if it's going to say how old it is. 
geography history. Let's look at the history here. It says ancient times. The, the original site was founded by an Irish hermit who gathered a following from the local community. Mont Saint Michel was used in the sixth and seventh centuries as an Armorican stronghold of Gallo Roman culture. Okay, sixth and seventh centuries in power until it was ransacked by the Franks thus ending the trans-channel culture that has stood since the departure of the Romans in 460. So this was right around the time of the Council of Nicaea, okay, about 500 years after Christ. From roughly the 5th to the 8th century, Mont Saint-Michel belonged to the territory of Neustria, and in the early 9th century was an important place in the marches of Neustria. Now, it's saying fourth and fifth centuries but it was probably established even before that and that's what i'll get to the bottom of once i walk these streets again and gather information so here's the journey you guys it's actually a dungeon like a torture junk dungeon i think that you have to pay to get in but wow so here's the castle it seems to have the cross in the middle here so this is going to be interesting All right. Oh, here we go. Okay, so they're showing it starting in the 10th century. But as we just read it, it's much older than that. And then this is actually the case that actually shows the progression of how it was built. And you can see here, 19th to 21st century. There's the cloister. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. Appreciate you guys coming out. Let's pop in the chat here for a little bit longer. You guys are like, you're 44? That's crazy. I know, right? God's bless me. And But to he who more is given, more is expected. Okay? And so I figure if I've got good health and youth, energy, and the ability to connect with people, I'm going to use that gift to the best of my ability. And that is right here with all of you. Okay. Now I've been sidetracked at certain times in my life, you know, relationships. <clears throat> that seems to be the, the one that always gets me. Right. But what I've learned is I'd much rather be here with all of you helping hundreds and thousands and even millions of people. We just hit 13 million views on this channel. That means 13 million people have seen the work on this channel. To me, that is, that's fascinating. Okay. And it reminds me of why I'm here. So every single person that comes through this channel is important. Okay. Much more important than any of my personal wishes and, and desires, because I have faith that God knows what is right for me. Okay. And not, no one person is going to step in the middle of that ever, ever again. So I appreciate you guys hanging in there. I appreciate all the support. Some of you have donated through PayPal. I appreciate that. Anything helps, you guys. Five bucks, it all helps. I'd much rather do it that way than hold you to some Patreon monthly thing. I don't, I don't, I just don't believe in that. Okay. For those that are able and willing, you've come to my PayPal and and drop some funds, and that's going to be crucial in, in helping to make this all work, okay? Like I said, I'm getting, like, rent at, like, half or a third of what it would normally cost because of this, this person in Christ who believes in the work on this channel, believes in me, and uh, we become good friends, and it's going to really help going forward. New, It's a new adventure, so I look at it. All right, I think that's about it. If any of you are interested in donating, there's links in the description of this video. It's always appreciated. Thanks, Identify This. I really appreciate it. I love you guys. Thanks, Clyde. Appreciate it. 
Uh, Sherry asks, can you send to PayPal with a Visa a debit card? I think so. I think you can do it without setting up any kind of account. If you click on the link in the description, everything in PayPal works on a, uh, what do you call it? An email address. So once you get into PayPal, you search the email address that's in the description and you'll be able to find out how to how to give. And I and I think you can just type in like a credit card and do like a one-time thing without opening an account. I think that works. So give it a shot. If not, you can email me and we can figure something else out, you guys. Yeah, your prayers. Always welcome, you guys. That's always welcome. I'm a strong believer that the will of God, that's always my prayer. It's the Lord's prayer. Pray that his will be done. Because I don't trust myself enough to pray for things or events or anything, even safety. Like I feel like everything is just going to happen the way it should. So when I pray, my prayers are pretty short. I just pray the Lord's prayer that his will be done. Now, I know there's other precedents in the Bible for other things that Bible patriarchs have prayed for. And I'm not knocking that, but that is pretty much where I'm at in my life. God will protect me if it's meant to be. If it's not, it's not. But hopefully I, I'm always glorifying him and his work. And uh, that's all that matters, you guys. All right. Sherry's getting some grass-fed meat from, that's another way you can help. Um, appreciate that, Sherry. Through U.S. Grassland Beef. That's links in the description as well. On all orders, they give me 8%. So far, we haven't gotten too many orders, and that's okay. But it sounds like Sherry's going to be the first one. So appreciate that as well, you guys. All right, I'm in the chat. All right, you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Appreciate all of you guys that were able to come out. I love Sundays. We get a good crowd on Sundays too, which is pretty cool. And like I said, these seem to always be – the best shows i don't know why it just is you guys it's awesome we'll be keeping an eye on this election i guess it, it might be election day as well in france so they pick a new leader and i'm seeing some hints of you know so it's kind of trump-like almost like this person's supposed to make france great again or something right so i'm always leery of any new leaders that come in but on the flip side, maybe things can change. I don't know. But we'll be keeping our eye on that as well, you guys. Much love to you guys. Have a wonderful day. Take care and be safe.